I am indeed grateful to have this opportunity to speak to this wonderful group of young men and young women, the students of BYU. Over the years, I have appreciated the many insightful speeches given at these devotionals. And I am not sure that I am qualified to be among that group. I do not believe that I have any great insights into the gospel. I do not have a new formula or a list to improve your lives, nor do I have any profound answers to gospel questions. I always admire those who do. A few years ago, I ran across an LDS book entitled Answers, referring to answers to difficult gospel questions. I am sure that if I were to attempt such a book, it would have to be questions, for there are still so many questions for me that are unanswered. For example, how does God keep track of all of the billions of people here on earth when I can barely remember the names of my children? <laughs> how does He receive answers? How does He receive and answer prayers? from millions who are praying to Him at any given moment? How does He communicate with us almost instantaneously when for us it would take four years just to send a radio transmission to the nearest star and another four years to receive an answer back? How is it possible for us to become like Him when the gulf between us seems so vast? I could go on for hours with questions like these for which I have no answer. The wonderful thing to me is that God has not given us all the answers, but He has given us the opportunity to grow and to struggle on our own with just enough knowledge to return to Him where we might finally receive the answers to all of these questions. With that preface, what I would like to share with you today is the only thing of which I am absolutely sure, that is, I know that God is there. He knows each one of us. He hears our prayers, and He loves us despite our shortcomings and our imperfections. For those of you who do not know me, which I imagine is most of you, let me start with a bit of my background. I grew up in the town of Pleasant View, Utah, just north of Ogden. During my early youth, it was a small town with just one LDS ward. In addition to the church, we had uh, one gas station, a grocery store, and by the time I reached second grade, we had our own elementary school. It was the perfect place for me to grow up, surrounded by a loving family, including my grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins all living only a few blocks away. Our town sat at the foot of a mountain called Ben Lomond. It still sits there, actually. <laughs> in the hills above Pleasant View and in the narrow canyons cut back into Ben Lomond, above these hills, I discovered something magnificent, rocks. I brought them home with me. They were my greatest treasures. My mother and father encouraged my interest in rocks while I was still very young. They let me bring rocks in the house and keep them in my room. I actually had cupboards full of rocks, and until a few years ago I still had some stored at my father's house. They bought me kits and books on mineral and rock identification. They took me to rock shops. They made mineral stops and geologic stops a regular part of our family vacation. At age 14 I went to get my patriarchal blessing. The Patriarch asked me a number of questions, and the only one which I truly remember today is he asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up. I responded, I want to be a geologist. So he put that in my blessing, and here I am today, having taught geology now at BYU for almost 22 years, still teaching, practicing, and believing in the principles that I have learned in geology, but also having a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ and a knowledge of its power and truthfulness. Some might ask, how is this possible? Aren't many of the principles taught in geology contrary to gospel truths? Isn't it true that most scientists are atheists or at least agnostics? 
In fact, most scientists believe in God, and no significant contradictions between their belief in God find no significant contradictions between their belief in God and their belief in science. Brigham Young long ago put it this way, Our religion will not clash or contradict with the facts of science in any particular. You may take geology, for instance, and it is a true science, not that I would say for a moment that all of the conclusions and deductions of its professors are true, but its leading principles are. They are facts. They are eternal." End quote. I have also found this to be true in my own personal search for unity between the realms of science and religious knowledge. However, it is not because I have discovered the answers to all of the difficult questions. As I stated earlier, I still have many more questions than I do answers. However, I accept both the things I have been taught and learned as a scientist and the things learned from the scriptures and prophets because both of them work. As a scientist, I have been trained to look for and accept those theories, ideas, and models that work. I have applied the same test to my religion and found that the promises made in the scriptures and by the prophets are true because they work. Let me share with you a few examples of what I mean. As I mentioned earlier, during my early years, we had only one ward in Pleasant View, and all but a couple of families in town were members of that ward. I really didn't know that any other churches existed. And later in life, it came as a bit of a shock to me to learn that everyone did not belong to the church that I belonged to. I can't say that I had a testimony of the truthfulness of the gospel because I really hadn't thought about it much. My parents were good and kind and loving parents, and I trusted them and their judgment. Then one day it happened. In our deacon's quorum meeting, our advisor decided that we would have a testimony meeting. I suspect that it was because he had forgotten to get the lesson that day. But nonetheless, we had to share our testimonies, each one of us. And it wasn't that I hadn't shared my testimony before. In fact, I was one of those kids who thought that bearing testimony was what we were supposed to do every fast Sunday and uh, was one of the first ones up to the stand to do so. But by the age of 12, it wasn't the cool thing to do. I suppose that we had about eight or ten deacons in our quorum at the time. And one by one, each one stood to bear his testimony. I was panicky because I just didn't know what I was going to say. I hoped that maybe the time would run out and I wouldn't be obligated to stand. But a small group of ten deacons sharing their testimony only takes about ten minutes. So there was still plenty of time left when the other boys had finished with their testimonies. I stood awkwardly and recited the same basic things that most of the others had said. I love my mom and dad. I know the Church is true. I know Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen, and I sat down. The thing was done. But for the first time in my life, I realized that it was a lie. The only thing that I had said that I knew to be true was that I loved my mom and dad. I really did not know that the Church was true, and I didn't know whether Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. But I knew then that I had to find out. I don't remember exactly when it was that I finally asked, whether it was that day or the next week or the next month, but I do remember that one night when my two brothers who shared a room with me were sleeping that I knelt by my bed and pled with my Heavenly Father to forgive me of my weaknesses and let me know if this church that I belonged to was truly His church. I had never prayed with such intent before, and I am not sure that I have ever prayed with such fervor since. I did not ask for a vision or a visitation. I really only wanted to know that someone was there. I was about 12 or 13 years old, and yet I can still feel to this day the power of the spiritual witness that came to me that night, confirming that this was indeed the Church of Jesus Christ. 
and that my Father in heaven knew me and loved me. The test had worked just as the scriptures had promised. But how is this possible? How is it possible for him to know me? How does he have the time to worry and contemplate someone as insignificant as me? I still ask these questions today and have no answer. In fact, when I contemplate God, the universe, eternity, and my place in this marvelous creation, I always struggle to understand. Perhaps you do as well. A few years ago, when I was first called as a counselor in the bishopric in my ward, I was out monitoring the hallway during Sunday school, trying to make sure that all of the young men had stayed in class. We generally didn't have trouble with the young women. As I came into the foyer, I saw one of our deacons wandering around holding his head, kind of like this, as if he didn't feel well, and I stopped and asked if he was okay. The young man replied that his head was hurting and felt like it was going to explode. I thought it might be something serious, and so I questioned him further about the problem. He told me that during class, the teacher had been talking about eternity and everlasting life, and that as he started to think about it, his head began to spin and started aching. I knew exactly how he felt, for I had had this feeling, this same experience myself on more than one occasion when I was a young boy. Nonetheless, and notwithstanding my feelings of total insignificance as I have pondered on God and eternity, I have a deep assurance that He is there and that in some way unknown to me, He knows who I am. He knows who you are, and He will respond to your needs. In 1977, I graduated from BYU and headed out to Madison, Wisconsin, where I had been accepted into the graduate program in geology. My major professor was a wonderful man by the name of Dr. Campbell Craddock. Cam had the reputation of almost never having seen the summer because he spent them working in Antarctica, Alaska, or the islands of the Arctic. Students who followed in his footsteps were sure to be cold, wet, and miserable during most of their graduate work. I signed on to work in Svalbard, a group of islands about 500 miles north of Norway. It was a spectacular and wonderful place to work. Four of us from Wisconsin, including Dr. Craddock, were deposited on the shore of an island called Spitsbergen in mid-July of 1978. I was thrilled to be on shore, because for the three days of our voyage on the North Sea in the refitted fishing boat called the Polar Star, I had lain in bed, only rolling over occasionally to vomit into the bag I kept by my bunk. The retching continued even long after there was nothing left in my stomach but a bit of saliva. During this time, I was almost hoping the ship would sink and my pain would be over. I prayed and asked God for relief. Once again, my prayer was answered. The test worked, although this time it was not in the way that I wanted. For into my mind came the following words. My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine afflictions and thine adversity shall be but a small moment. Endure it well, and all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. I don't suppose that was the answer Joseph Smith was looking for to his prayer either. I know that often I tend to push aside or ignore the answers that I don't want hoping that the Lord will change his mind. But usually this does not happen. Nonetheless, I was extremely glad when the small moment of affliction had passed and we were able to step onto solid earth. I was even able to smile again. That actually is me. <clears throat> and realize that the experience was one that hadn't been for my good, that had been for my good, excuse me. It had humbled me, brought me a better understanding of how much I needed my Heavenly Father, and later in life helped me to empathize more fully with my wife as she suffered through months of similar conditions during pregnancy. 
During the first month in Svalbard, we worked in teams of two as we examined the rocks and collected samples. The Norwegians who had transported us to the island had left us with a radio and instructions to contact them each week at a certain time. They warned us to be on the lookout for polar bears and for seals, the polar bear's main food. They explained that almost every year someone in Spitsbergen was killed by a polar bear and eaten. The previous year, they told us, a family of parents, children, and a bachelor uncle on a tourist cruise had disembarked to camp a few nights. The ship was to return for them in a few days. Tourists were not supposed to be off their ships camping, but some did it anyway. While this group was camping, the uncle, thinking he recognized the children, children playing outside of his tent door, stuck his head out, but it was not the children. The moment he put his head out, a polar bear ripped it off with one good swat and then dragged him out of camp and ate him while the rest watched in horror. Fortunately, the boat returned before the bear became hungry again. As you can imagine, after hearing stories like this one, and we were told many, we were always looking out over the ocean and over the landscape to see if a bear was approaching. We were particularly cautious when seals came into the bay. We carried with us rifles and 45 Magnum revolvers wherever we went. We slept with the guns at our sides. There was no place to run or hide if a bear had decided upon us as its next meal. About midway through the field season, Dr. Craddock was picked up by a helicopter and returned home to Wisconsin. This left three of us, myself, another graduate student named Ernie, and an undergraduate student named Jerry, to work for another month on our own. The problem was that Ernie needed to work in an area that was about 25 kilometers away from our base camp. I also had to do some work away from the base camp, but it was closer. The decision was made that Ernie and Jerry would pack out together to work for two weeks in the more distant area and leave me by myself. I don't know how many of you have ever been truly alone for an extended period of time, but for me it was a new experience. I had, of course, hiked alone in the mountains of Utah and camped alone and other things on my own, but I had never been alone for two weeks. I was doing pretty well and feeling that this being alone stuff wasn't all that bad. I was only occasionally talking to myself. When one evening the fog rolled in off the ocean, of course when I say evening I mean it would have been evening in Wisconsin or Utah, but in the Arctic where we were it was light 24 hours a day. The fog, however, this day was particularly thick and I was unable to see my hand when held out at arm's length. I ate my dinner and then retired to my tent, placing my rifle on one side of the bed and the pistol on the other. As I lay in bed, the sounds of the ocean, which usually had been so comforting and pleasant, were now muffled by the fog and seemed somewhat different. My mind began to interpret them differently. I was sure I heard something moving along the beach and knew it could not be my companions who were 20 to 30 kilometers away. Fear slowly crept into my heart and soul. It was a fear like I had never known before, the kind that makes a person think and behave in irrational ways. I was sure the sounds were the padding of a polar bear coming along the beach, and it would not be long until I was discovered. I imagined my companions returning to camp, finding a few mangled remains left from the polar bear's last meal. I sat up in bed with the rifle in one hand and the pistol in the other, in a state of panic, waiting for the inevitable to happen. It was at that moment that I remembered that I was not alone. I bowed my head and prayed fervently to my Father in Heaven to calm me and to protect me, and He did. His Spirit engulfed me. The fear was gone. I lay down and fell into a peaceful slumber. Once again, the test had worked. Once again, all I had been required to do was open the door, and he had entered. If these were the only incidents in my life when I had received answers to my prayers, then as a scientist I would probably have to reevaluate the promises 
and would undoubtedly be skeptical of their validity, passing these few experiences off as mere coincidences. However, such is not the case. I do not believe that I have ever had a sincere and fervent prayer that has not been answered. It is my belief that God wants us to test Him. He wants us to grow in spiritual strength by proving Him. At the close of the Book of Mormon, He exhorts us to ask, and He will reveal the truth unto us. To Oliver Cowdery, you remember, in the Doctrine and Covenants, he gave the challenge to study it out in his mind and then ask if it be right, to test him. To his disciples he taught, Ask, and ye shall receive, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He also said, I stand at the door and knock. He is, my young brothers and sisters, knocking at the door. But it is you and I that must open it if we want him to enter. I believe that I can truthfully say that my sincere prayers are always answered. As I mentioned earlier, that does not mean I have always liked the answer. For example, when I was about 17 or 18 years old, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. She was given many blessings and many prayers were offered. I prayed often that she would be healed. She fought the cancer valiantly and survived for about five years. One day, after I had returned from my mission, I was visiting with her and questioned why God had not answered our prayers, particularly since her patriarchal blessing had promised her a lifetime of good health. She told me that God had given her a lifetime of good health. She had rarely been sick prior to this time in her life. She felt that our prayers had been answered, for her life had been extended for several years when she might easily have passed away sooner. This was not the answer I wanted. But as I prayed again and pondered over what she had said, the Spirit confirmed to me that this was true. The problem was that I had not wanted an answer. I had wanted my answer. In our communion with God, we must ever be cautious and careful to not just talk, but to listen. Listen for His Spirit to guide us and teach us. As we do, we must be willing always to mold our will to His will. For how can our prayers ever fail if we are willing to put our lives in His hands? I have found that prayer works, that God never fails in His promise to us that He will be there waiting, knocking, hoping that we will open the door. It is a test that each one of us can make. It requires no sophisticated equipment, no federal grant money, and yet the results can be as incredibly exciting as any research performed with the best, most expensive equipment. Better yet, the results gained by experimenting on the Lord and upon His Word will have consequences that reach far beyond this world into the eternities. My challenge to each of you is to go to your homes and apartments, to kneel before the Lord and ask, to test Him and to try Him and then to listen for His answer. I bear witness that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true, that prayer is a reliable means of communicating with our Heavenly Father, that even with innumerable questions that are unanswered and perhaps unanswerable in this life, that we can know that He lives, that He loves us, that He knows us, each one, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.